that I know to start the recording. Um, instead of having 6033 in the news for you today, I just have 6033 news. Um, we might have some in the news segments at the end or that might happen on Wednesday. Um, so we heard from students about the DP. We'll have an announcement about that later today. Um, we have a staff meeting right after this to finalize some logistics. Just watch out for that on Piazza. We're gonna need some more information from you just a little bit, but we need you to fill out a form really, really, really fast um, so that we can make this week sort of as smooth as possible. Um, but everything's gonna be fine. All the logistics are gonna be fine. I have planned for every case. Okay, so let's talk about operating systems. All right, so at this point, we are all excited about modularity. It's a good thing. We are excited about the client server model that does a nice job enforcing modularity by physically separating machines. But now we're sort of on this quest to enforce modularity on a single machine, right? This is the job of an operating system. And you're starting to see that there's this same high level technique that the operating system uses to do this, right? So it uses virtualization. You've seen virtualization in one context. We talked on Wednesday about how virtual memory works, but you know maybe more importantly, or at least as importantly, why we use it, right? And we use virtual memory because we want the operating system to be able to provide a uniform interface to all programs. It sort of makes them think that they have access to all of the memory, but of course they don't, right? And the operating system takes care of handling all of those details, keeping all of that straight, it doesn't have to be constantly communicating back to programs about things like, you know, moving things around in memory or anything like that. And then we talked a little bit about these other two things that we're going to need to do, but we haven't addressed either of them, right? To get a functional operating system, we want a couple of other things. We want to enable programs to communicate with each other, just in the same way that we enabled the client and the server to communicate with each other. We also don't want to have one program that is basically able to like halt all of the other programs, right? So if we all have programs running on the same machine, maybe they're, you know, they're really well behaved. They're not trying to corrupt each other's memory. Maybe they're not even trying to communicate, but like my code goes into an infinite loop, right? You don't want me to then just have the processor forever, right? We want to deal with, with something. Um, we want something to deal with that. All right. So what are we going to see today? Today, we are going to deal with this second problem. So our goal today is to implement bounded buffers. Right? Bounded buffers are a data structure that's going to allow programs to communicate with one another. Right? And you're going to see some of the, some similar things um, that came up with virtual memory. Right? We'll, we'll talk about kind of see how this is virtualization applied to basically communication links. Um, we'll see the kernel involved here and doing a lot of stuff. Right. So a bounded buffer itself is a relatively, it's a relatively concise data structure. All right. The implementation of this data structure is not going to be hard because it's some sort of like weird tree or complicated, you know, whatever. Uh, it's going to be hard because we want a lot of different programs to be able to use it. All right. So to enforce modularity while still allowing programs to communicate, we're going to adopt the kind of the same message passing paradigm that we saw in the client server model, right? Programs aren't interacting directly with, with each other, but they're going to interact with the operating system via send and receive calls. This is going to give us a way to provide a remote procedure call mechanism between two programs. Right, so for this lecture, I'm going to focus on getting um, what we might talk about as one way calling to work. So if you're dealing with one way calling, you have one program sending and another program receiving. All right, so this, this one sends, this one receives. If we can get that to work, it's a pretty small leap to be able to allow them to both send and both receive. We basically have one buffer kind of going this way and another second buffer going the other way. All right. And so again, at the beginning, the implementation, it's going to look very small. It's, it's not going to have that many details, right? So although this paradigm is simple, uh, the implementation is subtle, right? And we're going to get into, we're, we're going to, we're going to uncover some problems. All right. So found a buffer. What is it? 
right? It is a buffer. So think of it, you think of it like a list or like a queue um, that stores up to N messages, right? It's, it's bounded because it stores a finite number of messages. Programs can send messages, they add a message to the buffer, and programs can receive messages. They can pull a message out of the buffer. That's the whole data structure, right? Now, we do want to imagine a world where, you know, sure, N is finite. We definitely want to imagine a world though where N is greater than one, right? We want to have this paradigm where we could deal with one program maybe sending a burst of messages, right? So I put a lot of message, messages into this buffer and then other programs kind of read them one by one, right? You'll actually see that style of communication in a lot of other places. Um, it's, it's why we have queues on the internet. We'll talk about that in a couple of weeks. Um, and this abstraction is also a lot like the Unix abstraction of pipes, which you're gonna talk about um, in recitation um, tomorrow. So we haven't really implemented anything. Um, there are a couple of subtleties already, all right? Um, suppose that, you know, I am a program and I, I want to receive a message, like I'm ready to process some message, I call receive. Um, if there's no messages in the buffer, oh, okay, hang on. Can you guys hear me? Like somebody say something or give thumbs up or something? Does it sound, can you hear me and does it sound okay? Yeah, it's we can sounding hear you. A it sounds worse. It's a little, it's a little weird, funny, yeah. But I don't, it, it's, it's perfectly fine. Now can I hear you? You know what, hang on. I'll just take the thing. That's better? Wild. We'll do this forever now. I don't even need headphones. Okay. Kevin says pretty good. Thank you, Kevin. That's a, I'll take, I'll take that compliment. Pretty good. Okay. Um, I can see the chat. So if anything goes weird, just stop me. Uh, you know what? I kind of hate zoom today. So that's just where I'm at for today. Okay. So let's get back to this buffer. Yeah. Right. Zoom is the worst. I'm so sick of zoom. Okay. But still bounded buffers are here and we need to implement them. Okay, so how are we gonna do this? What are the issues we're gonna contend with? One, a couple basic ones. I don't wanna send a message into a buffer that's already full. Like if there's no space for me to put a message into a buffer, that's gonna be a problem. I don't wanna try to receive from a buffer that doesn't have anything in it. That's like asking for a message and, and there's, there's nothing to deal with. Those subtleties are going to be relatively easy to deal with, all right? The bigger problem is what happens when multiple programs are sending to or receiving from the same buffer, right? Send and receive, they're gonna interact with some shared data structure, right? If we are not careful, we're gonna get some unexpected results, right? This is the issue of concurrency. So concurrency is a major source of complexity in systems. It is one we will turn to repeatedly in this class. When I was in college, it was absolutely my least favorite thing to have to deal with when I was writing code. All right, so a couple of things before we start implementing this bounded buffer though. I'm gonna, let's see, get us a piece of paper. All right, so some things that you cannot assume. If you have two programs, all right, program A and program B, you don't really get to assume anything about the order in which they're executed. It is possible that program A runs through all of its steps before program B. Could be that program B runs all of its steps before program A. Could be that their instructions get interleaved, right? That's gonna be a big issue for us today. And in fact, things get worse uh, because you don't even get to assume that any single line of code executes without some sort of interruption. So for instance, I give you an example line of code. There's my line of code. Among the most basic lines of code I could give you, right? x equals x plus one. In assembly language, this is typically three different instructions, right? Loading something, doing an increment, storing it somewhere else, All right? Your code could be interrupted at any one of those steps, All right? So by the end of this lecture, we are going to have a pretty full-fledged implementation of a bounded buffer, both the send call and the receive call, 
although we're going to keep talking about it on Wednesday, all right? We're going to work up to this with various attempts that just don't work, all right? But each of them is designed to eliminate a particular concurrency issue, all right? But so to get this implementation started, we need to know a couple of things, okay? Let's see. So I'm going to have this buffer, and you can, you can see this on the slide. You can literally imagine the buffer as it's like a list. It's got spaces to write messages. Right? Maybe this one can store five messages. All right. So question one: When is it okay to write? Right. When is it okay to write? And what that means is basically, you know, when is there space in the buffer, right? If this is all filled up with messages, it's not okay to write, right? And then analogous question, when is it okay to read? Right? That's equivalent to saying, well, when is there at least one message in the buffer that I can read? And then where do we read from or write to? Right? Like, where is the next message that I want to read? Or where is the next open space that I want to write? Right? And you can imagine this being a little bit interesting, right? Because say I write a message to slot one, two, three, four, five. A receiver comes in, it reads the first message. Oh, there's room for me to write a new message and I got to put it in the front border space. Okay, so this is sort of the basic part of the implementation that we're going to get um, figured out first. And we're going to do this by just keeping track of two variables, right? It's going to make our implementation pretty clean, right? So here are the two variables I'm going to keep track of. And once we get to a more full-fledged implementation, all of these variable names, they'll be on the slide too, okay? So I'll be able to remember them. So first variable is just in a word that I have a surprising amount of trouble pronouncing. Okay, so this is total number of messages written to the buffer. So this has to be safe for one receiver. Um, so good question in the chat. Right now, we're gonna worry about one sender and one receiver. In 10 minutes, we're gonna worry about more than one sender. All right, so I have in, and then I'm going to keep track of out, which is same except for read. All right, so as an example, let's get some colors out. All right, if I write message into the first slot, in goes from zero to one, and then message to the second slot, now in is two, in is three. If a receiver comes in and reads the first message, all right, now in is still gonna be three, but out is one, all right? And again, you're gonna see this in action on like every slide today. So notice that given this, We just subtract them. I'll move this up in a second so you can see it all. The difference between these variables is the number of messages currently in the buffer. All right. With these variables, as long as we're keeping track of these things correctly, just see in a second, we can answer these questions. All right. It's okay to write as long as there is space in the buffer. Right, as long as in minus out is less than n, right? And this is where n is as it is on the slide. That's how many messages we can store. So here, five, right? It's okay as long as there is at least one message in the buffer, right? So could say it this way, or could say it this way, I've written more messages than I've read, All right? Where do we read from and write to? In and out also tell us 
uh, the next place to um, to read from or the next place to write to. We just need to use a mod so that we keep wrapping around the buffer. Right? So reading. in the slot and writing will be in the slot. All right, so all we're going to do, and again, you're going to see this on the slide. It's not like the easiest piece of code you're ever going to encounter. But what we're going to do is we're going to keep track of these two variables. They're going to let us answer these questions. And when it's OK to write, we'll write to the next spot. When it's OK to read, we'll read from the next spot. And we'll go from there. All right, so let's look at this actually happening. Okay, so that'll come back in just a second. All right? Here is, based on what I just told you, an implementation of send. All right, so if send is going to spin all right, until we find that there's space in the buffer. All right, so if I call send um, and I find that the buffer is full, I'm just going to keep going, keep going, keep going, keep going until there's space in it. All right, then I'm going to go ahead and write the message and increment in. All right? We're not going to worry too much about performance yet. Performance is coming later. We're just worried about correctness for now. All right? And there's the variables that we're using, so you can keep track. And then similarly, receive, the code for send and receive, uh, they do look rather similar in many ways. Same structure, spins and systems in until there's a message in the buffer. Read it and increment out. OK? So this is our starting point. Um, and you know, there's only so many lines of code here, right? There's, these are only each about uh, exactly five lines, OK? So you know, it's kind of interesting to think just, you know, it, could, we, could we change anything about this code? Would it still work, all right? So suppose we have, um, suppose I want to do kind of the only thing I can do in send. So if you look at this send code, I'm going to take the two kind of most interesting lines, which I would argue are these two lines, all right? And just swap them, right? So swapped on their own. This is not going to be correct because I need to adjust where I write to, but that's fine. We can do that, right? I can do an increment and subtract one. It's maybe not as clean, but this appears to do basically the same thing, right? But let's think about it, OK? So program one has a message to send, right? Um, I'm going to let Karen, you're a program one. Just I don't know if you all can see, but Karen's program one. Yes, OK? Um, OK, and Howie is program two, because they are just always at the same spot on my Zoom screen, all right? Karen has a message to send, all right? She calls send, while true executes, um, and she finds that there is space in the buffer, okay. We'll say the buffer is empty, so in is zero, out zero. So she's so excited, she increments in, right? So now in is equal to one, and then I, the kernel, interrupt her, all right? So Karen incremented in. Karen's program, but Karen is the program in this example. Karen incremented in. She did not actually write the buffer. She didn't, or she didn't write the message to the buffer because I interrupted her. All right, which means now it's Howie's turn, right? I switch execution to Howie. He's trying to receive a message. So receives, says, while true, that executes, excellent. Is out less than in? Indeed, it is. Out is zero. Karen just incremented in to one. So Howie goes ahead and tries to read a message, right? He tries to read a message at slot zero. Is there any message there for Howie to read? No, there's not. Oh, someone did the little the little X on it. That's nice. I like that. Yeah, no, this won't work. All right. Welcome to concurrency, right? This looked like functionally the same code. Again, a little bit messier because I got to subtract a one, but it looked functionally the same. But it doesn't work. All right, it's incorrect if we swap those two lines. All right, so we're going to go back. We're going to go back to our original code. Um, and let's think about, OK, we've got one sender and one receiver, right? This is actually OK in the case of one sender and one receiver. The thing that is important here is making sure that we either write the message or read the message before we increment either one of the variables, all right? 
But of course, we don't want an implementation that works only for one sender and one receiver, right? Think about our client server model. We're not going to take over Amazon if we just have one client and one server. We want a lot of clients, right? Eventually, we want a lot of servers, right? So now we need to think about what's going to happen if two programs try to use this. OK, so normally what I do is in class, I get two students to come up to the front and like stand and be the programs. Um, obviously, we're not going to do that today. However, I've brought two th exciting things for you. So we're going to pay just attention to the send code. The only difference is here is that I've added line numbers because I want to be able to reference specific lines. And I have two calling programs. You each get to pick one to identify with. I don't care which one you pick. OK, but Broccoli is going to be program one. Broccoli is on the left. He's also back here on the chair. And Magnus is going to be program two. Magnus is my cat. You probably will never meet him because he hates affection of any sort. <laughs> All right. So Broccoli's trying to send a message M1. Magnus is trying to send a message M2. So let's just think, first of all, oh, also neither pet is better, better or worse than the other. OK, just pick your team, Team Broccoli or Team Magnus. Um, I truly, I'm not doing this just for fun. Um, I genuinely believe that this will be easier to understand if you think of yourself as one of these animals, <laughs> okay? So you're broccoli or you're magnets. So first of all, what do we even want to happen? All right, I could maybe do like a complicated thing where I say, well, oh, okay, if broccoli calls send first, I wanna make sure message M1 gets in there before message M2, right? I, like I could care about an ordering of these messages. Today, we're going to, we we have a much lower bar for ourselves. All we want is for both messages to get in the buffer, right? And we, you know, we don't want them to like overwrite other messages or something. So I don't care if M1 gets in before M2, vice versa. We just want them both in there. Okay. So let's see what could happen. The first case is going to go well. All right. The way I'm going to describe this to you. All right, so Broccoli and Magnus are both calling. Um, they're, they're both calling send. So they're sort of, they're both ready to execute the first line, right? That's what I mean by current line here. And I'm going to switch execution potentially back and forth between them. All right, so who's going first? Oh, we'll also keep track down here of what the variables are. So at the beginning, everything is blank. There's no messages, in is zero, out of zero. N is, N is large. N is not going to be the source of our problems. It's your favorite number as long as that number is at least two. Okay? It's just, it's it. Right? So we're going to have Broccoli go first. All right? So Broccoli gets to execute. He's asleep. I was going to see if he would come over at some point. All right? So Broccoli is executing. I have allowed him to execute on this machine. All right? So he calls send. He goes ahead to the next line. Is it true? It is. And I'm going to keep execution on Broccoli. Okay. He gets to keep executing. Now he's on line three. All right. Is in. Yeah, I know Broccoli woke up. But not, look at his. Look at his dumb head. All right. So is in minus out less than n? Yep. Zero is less than a very large number. And we're going to stick with Broccoli. Okay. So next line. I don't know why my arrow got a little messed up. I'll fix that on the slides when I post them again later. Um, he gets to write his message to slot zero. All right, so we're going to keep track of which message is where. It's going to go ahead and increment in. All right, so in is now one. It's going to go ahead and return. All right, broccoli is done. Now we're going to switch execution to Magnus. All right, Magnus is time to shine. All right, so same deal. He's going to go through this code. Broccoli and Magnus are the only two senders. There's nothing that's going to interrupt Magnus, so I'll go through this a little bit quickly. All right, he executes line one. Line two, yeah, it's true. In minus out is still less than n. There is still space in this buffer for Magnus to write his message. All right, so he goes ahead, puts his message in. Notice that m1 is still there, m2 is there, okay? It's going to increment in. It's going to return. Brilliant, right? This is exactly what we want, okay? This is perfect. So now, let's see what happens if I just vary the execution a little bit, 
right? Instead of letting broccoli run through all of his steps at once, I'm gonna bounce back and forth, all right? And we're gonna see what happens, all right? So here we are, we're back at the beginning, starting over, no messages in the buffer, right? In is zero, out is zero, N is very large, okay? And I know I, I'm not actually quite sure why, the arrow is not quite lining up on things, so I'll fix it in the slides, but just me talking, I'm, I'm correct. I know what I'm talking about, okay? So just listen if the slides aren't matching up quite exactly. So, okay, Broccoli gets to execute line one. The call to send executes. He's ready to execute line two, but I'm gonna switch, right? So Broccoli executed line one, he hasn't done line two yet. Now we're on to Magnus, right? Magnus is going to do his line. No one's going to get interrupted here in the middle of a line. That would be a disaster to explain on the slide. Okay. So Magnus goes ahead, executes line one, the call to send, and we switch back. All right. And this is how it's going to go. I'm going to bounce back and forth between each animal on each line. All right. So Broccoli's on line two. It says, yes, while wow, true, it is. All right. So he's executed that line. And before he can go to execute line three, uh, we're back to Magnus, all right? So Magnus, same thing, executes line two. Now it's Broccoli's turn, all right? He's gonna execute line three. Is in minus out less than n? Yes, zero, again, still less than a very large number. So he executes that line, all right? He's ready to write his message, but he has not yet. Okay, we're back to Magnus. Magnus executes the same line. The same thing remains true, all right? So he's ready to do line four. Now we're back to Broccoli, all right? Broccoli is gonna go ahead and actually execute line four, all right? So he's going to put his message in to slot zero because in is zero, all right? So he does that. You can see the update there. And now he's ready to go to line five. I'm gonna interrupt him, all right? And this is where things get exciting. I mean, things have been exciting this whole time, but this is where like anticipation is really high, right? Because Magnus is about to execute line four. He's gonna put his message into buff sub in, right? In is zero. Broccoli didn't get to increment in yet. So Magnus puts his message in, now M1 is gone, All right? This is a problem. We'll do the rest of it just for fun. All right, broccoli increments in. Magnus increments in. Broccoli's done. Magnus is done. This is not what we wanted, right? Magnus got his message in. Broccoli didn't get his message in. This is an example of a race, right? So both programs kind of running through the code. Uh, one of them will win, I suppose. Magnus won here. Um, so races are tricky. They are really tricky. In part, this code was fine when there was one sender and one receiver. Now it's not fine, and I've only introduced two senders, right? But moreover, figuring out where races are or if there are races, it's dependent on the particular execution, right? This first execution worked fine, right? If Broccoli did all of his stuff before Magnus did anything, it was okay. It's only that last sequence of events that brought us into a problem, all right? So in order for this buffer to accommodate multiple senders, we need an entirely different new paradigm, okay? We need locks, all right? So the problem here is that this implementation introduces race conditions with multiple senders. Let's we're gonna focus on send. Where's my locks? There we go, okay. We want locks, okay? Our earlier problem did stem from the fact that basically Broccoli put his message into the buffer before incrementing in, all right? I, the kernel, interrupted him in between those two lines. I also could have interrupted, remember, at any point in that increment line, it's multiple sections, uh, instructions in assembly. And the thing that's gonna help us with this is locks, all right? Locks allow only one CPU to be inside a piece of code at a time, all right? And so remember, we're in a world where each program is running on each CPU. Broccoli and Magnus both have their own CPUs, all right? So we're gonna think about how can we apply locks to this code, all right? So before we 
before we do that on send, let's let's back up a second. Think about locks a little bit more generally. Okay. Move this over here. Move right into the middle. Doesn't really matter where it is. All right, so suppose I have this is some pretty generic code. We'll start with our increment that we had before, and then we'll say, I don't know, y equals x. Now let's suppose we sort of want to we want to like protect this code, all right? We want to guarantee that you know only one CPU can be sort of in this section of code at a time. How might we do that, all right? Well, I'm gonna think of I'm gonna have some third variable. I'll call it x lock. You'll see other examples, all right? And I might write code that looks like this. So what does this mean? All right. This variable, x lock, only one CPU is allowed to acquire that this lock at once. So if Karen and Howie both call acquire x lock, only one of them gets it. Only one of them gets the lock. The other is going to block. All right. It's just going to spin. spin. All right. So we'll say Howie gets it. Howie gets to execute things. He's not going to be interrupted. All right. He's um, he's going to keep going until he releases the lock, right? So one important thing to note, though, and again, you, you're going to see me do other examples with locks. I didn't write something like acquire x, right, or like acquire lock y, right? The meaning of acquire is sort of like saying, uh, like, like I just acquired a flag that is intended to protect a particular object, right? Here, perhaps it's intended to protect x. The meaning of a lock isn't I just acquired this object. All right, so again, if two CPUs try to acquire the same lock at the same time, one succeeds, but one blocks. So let's try to fix this with send, all right? And so again, our earlier problem stems from the fact that a program can be interrupted, all right? After I add a message to the buffer, but before I do this increment, all right? So here's one idea, all right? One idea is, okay, we're going to put a lock around those two lines of code. All right, so this is a new lock that I have introduced to this. All right, before writing a message into the buffer, a program has to acquire the lock, right? That would mean that, you know, Broccoli has to acquire this lock before he can write his message. All right, and he doesn't release it until the increment's in. All right, so if Magnus comes in, tries to send his message, he's not going to be able to get the lock. Right? Only one of them can get the lock, right? So we're sort of guaranteeing that this message and this increment happen at the same time, right? So this, you know, potentially looks okay, right? But I don't know. I think you all have been in this class long enough to know now. I mean, we're in lecture four. It's pretty rare that I introduce something to you that works right away, right? So... Here's an example question. I made this a poll. We're going to see if this poll works. Why would Zoom put it there? All right. So I want you to think about this. Oh my gosh, Zoom. Literally the worst program. All right, so we have a buffer. It's almost full. All right, you can hold up to 10 messages. It's got nine in it. Two programs are trying to send. No one else is around. All right, what might happen here? And it's select all that apply more than one thing could happen, right? I'm just going to talk while y'all are reading, right? Um, so maybe one of those messages gets in, the other blocks, right? Maybe they both get in, but, you know, one of them overwrites an existing message, or maybe they both block and don't really get anywhere, All right? So think about this, I don't know, for 30 seconds or so, and we'll go through this. Oh yeah, so you can assume that the, they're using this code, right? So this is the send code that they're using. So you have this this blocking the way that I did it here. And it's anonymous, so I won't I won't share the answers. So ten more seconds. Okay. Zoom, I'm just going to die, honestly. Okay, so one, th 
there's a lot of things that could happen, um, but indeed something bad could happen here. All right. So imagine this case, you have Broccoli and Magnus again, switching execution back and forth between them. All right. They're both trying to send. We've got nine messages in a buffer that can hold 10. All right. They both call send. They both execute while true. They both do this check, right? They do the check and they both say, hey, there's room in the buffer. That's so exciting. I'm going to try to acquire the lock. They both try to acquire the lock. Only one of them gets it. We'll let Magnus get it first this time, right? Magnus gets the lock. Wonderful. Puts his message in, increments in, releases the lock, right? Now we all know that the buffer is full, right? We know that. However, Broccoli's next move is to acquire that lock. Right, Broccoli already did the check. Right, he said, "Hey, there's there's space in the buffer." Right, he's blocking on acquire. He acquires the lock. He puts his message in. Right, overwriting some other message. All right, so this is not going to work for us. All right, part of the reason it's not going to work for us is because you know we made these two lines atomic. That was a good idea, but that check now is sort of sitting outside of that action, right? In particular, right, this line here is outside of that lock, right? So, okay, let's change some things. This is, this is fun. Locks are always fun. Okay, so I'll try something else, right? I'm gonna acquire a lock, spin, do my checks, release the lock, right? Because the previous problem happened in part because we were checking whether there was space in the buffer before we got the lock. Okay, so I'll change this. And you know, now I think it would be useful to see what would the analogous receive code be, right? Before send was sort of enough to cause problems for us, but now let's think about receive, all right? So again, they, they remain looking very similar. All right, so now, okay, now we'll think. You are Broccoli or Magnus. Right? You go ahead and you send a message. And let's now imagine, let's imagine the buffer is full. All right? You try to send a message, you get the lock, you find that the buffer is full. All right? That's fine. You're not going to overwrite things. You're just going to spin, you're going to spin, you're going to spin, you're going to spin. All right? The buffer is full, right? You need space in the buffer before your code can progress. You need someone else to receive a message. You need someone to take a message out of that buffer, right? They need to be able to receive a message. Is that possible, All right? So you're sending, you hold the lock, you're spinning, you're waiting for there to be space in this buffer. Is anyone going to be able to receive? I won't do a poll, you can just think about it. No, not the way I have it, right? Receive can't get the lock. These locks, this is the same lock, All right? So indeed, they're gonna sit here forever, All right? We're gonna refer to this problem as deadlock. Um, in this class, we use deadlock to basically mean two programs are waiting on each other. Neither of them can make progress until the other one does, All right? So in fact, this is not gonna work for us either. Here's what we're going to end up doing. We're going to end up doing something that looks a little bit messy. All right, so I'm still going to acquire in both of these functions, acquire the lock first thing. All right, I'm going to hold a lock on that buffer while I check whether it has space or has a message. All right, but if I find that it doesn't, I'm going to do this. All right, I'm going to release and then acquire again. All right, and the reason this is happening, I'm going to release the lock so that some other program has a chance to jump in and get it, all right? Doing release and then doing acquire, the, there's certainly all sorts of chances to be interrupted between them. So once I release a lock, it does not mean that I'm gonna be the one to acquire it next, right? This lets other programs jump in and acquire the lock themselves, right? I do not know why none of this is lining. Like everything is terrible today is how I would rate this thing. All right, so give up the lock to allow other programs to access the buffer. Now, if you look at this code, you may think, I don't feel great about this. 
you might not feel great about this for any number of reasons. One of the reasons I don't feel great about this, that's a lot of performance issues, right? If I'm trying to send and I find that the buffer is full, you know, I release and then I acquire. And unless someone has actually received a message, I'm, I'm gonna release and acquire and release and acquire. And this is a lot of context switching. It's a lot of stuff going on here. So if you feel a little bit unsettled by this code, that's great. Um, you're gonna be a little bit unsettled by it for the next 48 hours. And then on Wednesday, we're gonna revisit it, All right? But we spent a lot of time with bounded buffers now, but we've spent a solid 35 minutes or so, 40 minutes or so on bounded buffers. Let's, let's, let's branch out. Let's think about locks somewhere else. All right, we're gonna come back to bounded buffers on Wednesday, All right? Locks are here for us in many places. They help us create atomic actions. So an action is, an action is atomic, it executes all at once. Um, but balancing performance is a challenge. You already saw a little bit of a performance issue on the previous slide, but let me show you something else, all right? We're gonna, we're moving off from bounded buffers. We're gonna move files from one directory to another, all right? You talked about files in Unix now, moving a file from one directory to another kind of under the hood, there's not actually a ton going on. You don't have to physically move the file in the file system, but you just unlink it from one directory and link it to the new directory. But you can imagine, oh, I'm dealing with the file system, like I, I, it, it might be bad if this code gets interrupted in the middle or something like that. There's a couple of different approaches we could take, right? Here's approach one. Approach one, a very coarse grained approach to locking. I'm gonna have one lock that is intended to protect the entire file system. That's why I've called it FS lock, right? Anytime you want to move a file, you have to acquire that lock, move your file, and then you release it, All right? So this means if Karen and Howie and Mark and Sam and Wesley and I are all trying to move files at once, we're only going to be able to do it one at a time, All right? Karen gets this lock first. She moves her file. Then I get the lock. Then Howie gets the lock, okay? Then, you know, in terms of correctness, this, this might be fine, but it sure doesn't seem great from a performance standpoint, right? Imagine that Howie is moving um, his file from directory A to directory B. I'm moving my file from directory C to directory D. They are totally different files. They're totally different directories. They have nothing to do with one another. And yet I have to wait for Howie to finish his work before I can do mine, right? This is, just, we're, we're not getting a lot of the benefits that we can, should be able to get from a computer, right? And this is common. A lot of times, if you take this coarse grained approach to locking, you'll find this. It might be pretty, pretty easy, pretty easy to get things to be correct, but they probably won't perform well. You won't get any of the benefits of doing things concurrently. So we'll take a more fine grained approach, all right? We'll have locks for each directory, all right? And here's how I've used them first. This means that, okay, if Howie's moving his file, from directory A to directory B. I'm moving my file from directory C to directory D. And those, again, they're totally different directories. There's no weird symbolic links or anything. We're gonna be okay. How he's dealing with a different set of locks and I'm dealing with, I'm not gonna block while he's trying to acquire. Like, it's great, it's great. Howie and I can work together side by side. We're so happy, all right? However, so there's a little bit, something, something could happen here. All right, imagine, you know, I'm moving, a I'm moving my file from directory A to directory B, all right? I go ahead, I get the lock for A, and I execute all of this, all right? I unlink the file from directory A, and then I'm, un I'm interrupted, all right? Where is my file? I mean, like, it's still on disk, I didn't delete it. It's not in directory A, it's not in directory B yet. It's not really in a directory, right? And this can be especially problematic if somebody, while I've been interrupted, say deletes directory B or renames it or just does something else to it, right? We're exposing the inconsistent state here, right? This approach of finer grained locking, performance-wise, it's good, but we don't have it quite right here, right? 
So, okay, we want this unlink and link. We want that to be a tonic. We, we don't want any interruption in between those lines. Okay, so get both blocks, draw unlink and link, and then release both blocks. All right, this is looking better. We've still got fine grain locking. All right, I've got my unlink and link protected. All right, but now imagine this. Of course it doesn't work, okay? Of course there's a problem, right? This whole day is full of problems, right? How he's trying to move his file from directory A to directory B, right? I'm trying to move a different file from directory B to directory A, all right? So how he's moving a file here to here, I'm moving my file here to here. That's fine, that's allowed. So how he gets his lock for directory A, right? Wonderful, and then he's interrupted. My code executes, I get the lock for my first directory, which is directory B, then I'm interrupted. Well, how he's waiting on the lock for directory B, which I have, I need the lock on directory A, which Howie has. And now Howie and I stop working together so nicely. In fact, we just cease to work at all. We just sit here for the rest of time, right? This is a more classical example of deadlock, right? More classic example of deadlock. Where literally in that example, I have a lock that Howie needs and Howie has a lock that I need and we just can't progress, right? One way to get around this is to guarantee that any time multiple locks are held, they are acquired in the same order, right? So that if Howie's dealing with directory A and directory B, and I'm dealing with directory A and directory B, we both acquire directory A's lock first, right? And then directory B's, no matter whether we're going from A to B or from B to A, right? So we could do that with something like this, right? Every time move gets called, Compare the I numbers of the directories, right? You've seen this in the Unix paper. Acquire the lock for the directory with the smaller I num first, right? Do your unlinking and linking, and then release the locks. And you could release them a little bit earlier. Um, that should be up one. Again, I have no idea why this has happened, right? I'll fix it on the, on the PDFs, right? So this, this, should, this should work. Right? But it's it's kind of painful. All we wanted to do, but Howie and I just wanted to move files. We weren't even trying, like, we just wanted to move files and look at what's happened, right? The reason this is a little bit painful is it requires kind of this global reasoning about locks. And it requires a way that we can ensure that locks are acquired in the same order. We got lucky here. That there's a notion of like a number that I can associate with the directories, right? So at this point, you've seen multiple locking disciplines. You've seen kind of the, the struggles of dealing with where to put locks and some of the performance issues. We're going to revisit all of this in later lectures. The last thing I want to talk to you is about how do we even implement this? How does the kernel implement acquire and release, all right? Because there's an interesting issue here, all right? We're going to treat lock, the, the lock that we're trying to acquire, just as a flag. It's like a Boolean variable. It's true, it's one, if somebody's holding the lock. And it's false if no one's holding the lock. All right, so this is, this is sort of a straw man approach, but let's see how it would go. All right, so we're going to build up the code for each of these. Certainly when I release the lock, I'm going to set this flag to zero. I don't hold the lock anymore. Nobody's holding the lock. All right, it's equal to zero. Right, acquires a little bit more involved, right? If I go to acquire this lock and I find that it's one, right? I find that it's not zero. That means someone else holds it. Spin, 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 right? Can't be acquired, right? But once someone has released the lock, once it's zero, I'll go ahead and set it to one, right? But now imagine, right? You're thinking one minute left, this code must work. No, don't get complacent, all right? Imagine two CPUs run acquire, all right? They both happen to see that lock is equal to zero. Okay, nobody holds the lock yet, all right? So they go through this while loop, it's equal to zero. They're, they're both done, they're executing basically one after the other. One of them sets lock equal to one, and then the next sets lock equal to one, all right? You have a race condition in this code you basically need locks to implement locks, 
all right? This would be a problem. The way that this is dealt with in real systems, um, there is hardware support. There is a special instruction, an atomic exchange operation. I'll put some details in the notes if you're interested um, uh, on exactly how that works. But the main thing I want you to take away from this is that to get locks to work, you need a little bit of hardware. It's just like how to get virtual memory to work, we needed one physical address. Just like how to get DNS clients to work, they need an IP address of a root server. Right? So there's this little piece of hardware or something that we need to get work um, to get all of this to work. Right, so there are some lingering issues here. I know we're out of time, so apologies for the mic troubles at the beginning. Um, there are a couple of lingering issues with this. One, this is just a lot of releasing and acquiring. All right, we're gonna deal with that on Wednesday. And there's also just something a bit unsatisfying about locks and needing this global understanding of how they're used and sort of all of this complexity. We will also come back to that later in 033. So this idea of having atomic operations needing to deal with concurrency. So if you're a little bit like eh, on all of this, right, it's okay. So am I, well, things will get better on Wednesday. Hopefully Zoom will work, my slides will work, my mic will work, all right? But now we've done bounded buffers, all right? So we're two thirds of the way to having a working operating system. Come back on Wednesday, we'll talk about threads. Um, you will, again, see many examples of code that doesn't work and then doesn't work and then doesn't work and then finally works, all right? So I'll stick around if there are questions. Um, if not, I'll see you all on Wednesday.